Geek Wisdom. Disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this article are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of my employer. Examples of analysts and code used within this presentation are only examples. They should not be utilized in the real world products as they should be considered as based on limit and possibly dated open source information. Assumptions made within this presentation are not reflective of the position of any private or government entity to which the author is presently employed. Hello, and welcome to today's learning program, Internet Programming 101. Today we're going to be looking at Internet Programming, or the Internet, from the perspective of an application programmer. So we're going to focus on the application layer of what's known as the TCP IP stack, the Transport Control Protocol slash Internet Protocol, which is a multiple different layers that we're not going to get into today. Today we're going to look at the application layer, which consists of applications, programmers, programs, and processes that use the network. Some of the topics we're going to talk about today, what exactly is the internet from a programming perspective? What do we mean about client-server communication? What is the Internet Engineering Task Force and request for comments? And what are the different protocols? Specifically, we're going to talk about protocols like the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol and the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, which drives the web. By the end of today's session, you'll know how to build a very simple web server. That sounds pretty cool, isn't it? Lesson one, this is not the internet. This is a web browser. The page that I'm on is Google, and it forms a part of the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web is part of the internet, but by itself, it's not the internet. The internet is a collection of protocols, ways of communicating between different machines over the network, and there's many different ways. The World Wide Web, or the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, is only the more recent way of doing it. Email has been around a lot longer, and you're familiar with that, and it uses what's called the Simple Mail Transport Protocol and the POP Post Office Protocol in order to send and receive email, respectively. There's also a collection of news groups that were on the internet called Usenet. And when you wanted to chat, you would use a protocol called Interrelay Chat. So the internet's not the same as the World Wide Web. It's just the World Wide Web is so big, everybody thinks of the World Wide Web as the internet. It's this collection of different protocols, Telnet as well, SSH, Usenet. Now back in my day, we didn't have the World Wide Web. We use tools like Gopher and Archie to search FTP sites, which was the way that we would transfer files. And we would play games without any graphics using things like Telnet and, of course, news groups. There was even something called WIAS, which was the precursor to the World Wide Web. It was a, a giant information system. So you would connect to the Internet. And you would wait, and you would wait. Mostly this was done at universities. And when you connect it, there were no graphics, there were no video screens, there were no images. It would just be this green screen command prompt that would let you go onto the internet. And if you wanted to log in, you would have some cool handle that you would log in with. And then that would let you in. And then if you wanted to check your mail, you would type a command like mail. And you're like, oh, I have email one. And help was very important because it would tell you all of the things that you could do. Uh, you could read, you could compose, you could send email, you could quit. And then if you wanted to read the news groups, you would use something like Usenet. And you'd be able to go in and say, oh, well, let me learn about this message of 1200 baud modem. So you would type 40FD3, and then there would be the message, and you could post back to the news group and everybody could read it. Again, a lot of this stuff was done on university servers. So you would connect to different universities all around the world, although 
probably mostly in the United States and in Canada, and sort of play around and send things back and forth. Not very fancy, right? Not very graphics. Not what we think of today as the internet. But the entire internet that we have today is based on this exact same system. Now the primary thing to understand about the internet is this collection of machines all talking to one another. So you could be at a server at your local university, and we'll pick on the University of New Brunswick in Fredericton, and you could be chatting to other servers at other universities, both in Canada and outside. You could be connecting to the Harvard University as an example. So all these clients, which are basically connected via modems or connected via some sort of network connection would talk to the servers and then those servers could talk to other servers. So when we talk about a client, we talk about the machine that is sending the information and the server, the machine that's doing it and processing it in some way. Our examples today are written in the C programming language. I chose C because it's a common language that a lot of internet servers have been written in. Certainly there are some servers out there today that are written in other languages, such as .NET or .Java. But back in the early days of the internet, and back as everything running in Unix and Linux machines, they were mostly written in C. Now if you're a programmer and you're not familiar with the C programming language, just do a Google search for C programming tutorial, and I'll just wait for you to come up to speed. Just push pause on the video now until you're ready to come back. Okay, great. So now I'm going to assume that you're an expert in C programming. If you're not a programmer, just a word of warning. Uh, you probably will get some of the jokes and some of the humor that I put throughout, but the actual code that we look at uh, might confuse you, might be boring to you, you might find it not all that interesting. So that's just a fair warning. We're going to be talking about things such as reading and writing files, interpreting files, um, and using sockets. All of these use the general C compiler, GCC, running on a Linux system. You could try doing it with SIGWIN. That might work. I didn't actually try that with GCC. Or if you really want to get fancy, you could try to use the Windows implementation of the internet called WinSock and use the libraries and try to cross compile them onto Windows. Have a lot of fun with that. The easiest thing to do would be to set up a Linux virtual machine to test these on and install the basic dev tools to get your GCC compiler. In our first example, we're actually going to do the very first program that you will learn in pretty much any language, which is called the Hello World program. Then we're going to talk about the interpreter design pattern and what that is and how that works. We're going to show an example of reading and writing from a file, and then we're going to show a couple of examples reading and writing from sockets. And we'll see that there isn't much difference between reading and writing from a file and reading and writing from a socket. So let's begin with the classic program every programmer learns as their first program. Call that listing1.c. It's your basic hello world program. There's not much to it. It has a main function and it calls the fprintf function, which takes the word hello world and prints it out to the console. So we're going to compile that very simply. And then we're going to run it. I use a.out. Just that's going to what all of our examples are going to compile in today as an a.out file. And then we write it and it writes out hello world. Not too amazing, but you know, pretty common pit thing. Okay, so before we get into listing two, we're going to talk about a very common design pattern in software engineering. It's called the interpreter pattern. The interpreter pattern evaluates a set of, we'll call them sentences, and a sentence is a command such as add and a set of parameters that go with it. In this case, we have one and two. So when you type the command add one and two, it does the addition of one and two and returns the result. The function that takes those commands, interprets them and processes them, we call an interpreter. Now, if this sounds familiar, I'm sure you've heard of it before. 
if you've done anything in an operating system, operating systems have interpreters built on top of them. So command.com or command exe is a common interpreter to interpret the commands when you want to get a directory structure or you want to copy a file. All those different commands are run by the command interpreter. If you're familiar with interpretive programming languages, ones that don't have compilers, could be a batch programming language, VB script. These all interpret all of the commands that you type and run execute those functions. So it's a very common thing that we see over and over and over again in different ways. So that's the interpreter design pattern. So I'm going to show you an example of that with listing two C or just listing two. Listing two dot C. So to do the interpreter design pattern, we've created a very simple function here called process. Process takes in a sentence. And here I've created some variables called command to hold the command of the sentence. I've created the output that I'm going to return. So I've called that result. So in these examples, my command can be as many as 5,000 characters and my result can be as many as 10,000 characters. And then I have two parameters that I'm going to allow parameter one and parameter two. This next line, S scan F, that takes the sentence in and it breaks it into three, three parts, the command, the parameter one, and the parameter two. Now I have an if statement, or some people might use a switch statement on this, that looks at what all the different commands are that your interpreter is going to allow and figure out how to execute them. So I'm going to do a comparison and say, well, is the command echo? And if it is, then I'm just going to take whatever the first parameter is, and I'm going to echo that back to this res result string, and then I'm going to return that result. Well, what if the command typed was add? So then I'm going to look at those two parameter ones and parameter twos. I'm going to convert them to their float form. That's what the percent %d is. I'm going to sum them up, and then I'm going to return back as part of the processing. The result is whatever one, whatever those two numbers were, one plus two, three, example. The last command I'm going to look is for the command quit, which means, OK, I'm done processing. So if I see the command quit, then I'm going to send back the message goodbye. So this is a very simple interpreter that just has three abilities, to echo something, to add two numbers, and of course to quit. I got a catch all so that if they try to type any other command, it'll just say bad command, meaning I don't know what that is. And if you've ever used something like uh, command.com and you typed in a command that it doesn't understand, it returns a very similar message, bad command or file name. So that is my main interpreter pattern. Very simple, very small. Now my main function, I simply have a loop going that's going to keep asking what is your command, reading that command, processing that command, and then outputting to STD out what that response is. And if the response that comes back happens to say goodbye, then I know to end the loop. This next little function is just a little helper called string position. Uh, it just helps you find where in a string a piece of text is. And I use that in my code to determine what the different commands are that might be done. So let's compile that. And now let's run it. And you can see it's asking me what is my command. So if I type in something that makes no sense, I get bad command, makes no sense. Now what if I type something like echo hello, it prints back hello. Or as in the example that I've given in the presentation, I could type the command add and I could type two numbers, let's say eight and four, and it comes back and it tells me the result is 12. Until I type the command quit, and then it says goodbye to me, and the program exits. So that's the interpreter pattern. Now in the example I gave before listing 2.c, we kept reading the commands from the console for the user to type. We could have done it a little bit differently. In listing 3.c, we have the exact same process function, so nothing has changed there. That's our interpreter pattern. But let's say we instead ran the commands from a file. So we're opening a file called commands.dat. We're going to read each command from the file instead of what the user types. We're still going to call the process and we're still going to echo the results. So we're just taking the data from a file instead of from the console that the user types. So let's compile that. 3.c. 
and I'm just going to show you this is what's currently in that file. So we have echo hello world, and then we echo adding one and two, and then we actually add one and two, and then we echo adding four and five, and then we actually add four and five. So let's try running that. Got it. And it's going to read that file, and it's going to do exactly what we said. It echoed hello world, then it echoed adding one and two, then it told us the result was three, then it added four and five, and told us the result is nine. Okay, so let's take a moment to review. At the very bottom layer, we have our operating system. On top of our operating system is running some sort of command line interpreter. Now, that could be your command.exe in Windows, or your bash shell, or your C shell, that's interpreting those commands that we type. On top of that, we have our program, which in this case was called listing3.c. Inside listing3.c, we have our interpreter, which was responsible for taking those commands like add and echo and interpreting them to do what it is we want to do. And the main function there is called process, and it takes in a sentence. Now at this point, it would be 100% completely reasonable for you to ask the question, okay, what the frack does that have to do in any way with internet programming? Shh, come here, come closer, right up to the monitor. Closer, I know you're not really coming closer, I can tell. Dave, now come on, come on closer. Are you listening? I'm about to reveal to you a very important secret. So don't tell anyone. Shh. Are you ready? Here we go. There is nothing new in computer science. In fact, there is nothing new in information technology. Nothing. I call this Brad's Special Analogy Hypothesis. Everything that can be discovered, or known, or invented in computer science, or in information technology, has already been discovered, has already been invented, has already been known. Now you say to yourself, how can this possibly be? We know technology advances so fast, people can hardly keep up with all the new terms, with all the new things, the way that things are working. But all we're really doing is coming up with new ways to solve the same old things. And even those new ways aren't really new. They're based on initial concepts, initial ideas that were expanded on, and we changed some of the terminology around to make it sound a little bit different, give them a fancy name for the same thing. Now, I first came up with this theory back when I first learned my second programming language. So my first programming language was in BASIC beginners, all-purpose, symbolic instruction code. And when I first learned BASIC as a young child, I learned concepts such as variables, and loops, and if statements. And I learned the famous go-to statement, and subroutines, and functions, and how this all works, and how this all comes together. When I learned my second language, which was C, it didn't take me long to realize all these same things are there. They look a little bit different. The way you write an if statement in C isn't the same as you write an if statement in basic, but it's still an if statement. Loops, whether they be for loops or a do while loop, work the same way. Just the way that you type it is different. Variables, same thing, work the same way. If you want to learn another language like Java or like .NET, you're just taking those same concepts that you already know. Even within languages, we say we have functional programming languages or procedural programming languages and object-oriented programming languages, but they all still have the same basic concepts. They still have the same basic ideas. And when they build and they compile, they get broken down into the same machine code that has to execute on the computer to do those instructions. So there's nothing new. It's just a different way of doing the same old thing. And this expands beyond just the idea of programming. It expands to a lot of computer science concepts, a lot of ideas around the internet and around uh, communication, whether we be reading or writing a file versus reading or writing an internet socket versus reading or writing over a communications port. It's the same idea. 
different terminology we refer to in in communications we might say that it's the data terminal device but in sockets we may call it a client or a server different words the same concept think about a television you probably have one of the latest greatest high definition or 4k televisions and it doesn't have a picture tube anymore right it uses LCD or LED technology but the concept of displaying stuff on the television hasn't changed we've improved the way that it looks but we didn't create anything new so this leads to what I call my general analogy hypothesis we can say for any discipline X and that could be computer science it could be engineering it could be art it could be literature it could be history everything that can be discovered it could be physics everything that can be discovered about that thing has already been discovered has already been known in fact in photography they have a special word and I'm not going to pronounce this correctly, I'm sure. Vemodalin. And it's defined as the fear that every photograph has already been taken. So if you're into photography, you may have just captured an amazing photograph of a sunset or an amazing photograph of a lightning bolt or something in nature that you think, wow, nobody's ever captured this in, in quite that way. And then you do the research after you've developed the photograph and you realize that there's hundreds of photographs just like the one that you did. They're already been known. I've already been taken. One time I was out on a on the step and I seen a spider that I had never seen before. I thought that's a cool spider. And I took a picture of it to see, you know, what kind of spider was that, only to realize it basically was just a common household spider. I just never seen that kind of spider before. And I thought I took this really cool photograph and I posted it to the internet and quickly got a response, oh yeah, that's this spider, and it's already been classified, it's already been known. In fact, this goes so deep that even my hypothesis has already been invented. So there's a guy in 1899, he was a commissioner of the U.S. Patents Office. His name is Charles Duell, and he's been at, uh, attributed to the expression, everything that can be invented has been invented. And there's some debate around whether or not that was his statement, um, but that was the idea. In physics, in fact, uh, Max Planck, uh, also around the 1800s, was sort of debating whether or not somebody should even go into the field of physics because at the time he figured everything that can be known about physics has already been known. There's nothing new to learn. There's nothing new to advance upon. So we do learn. We do expand on our existing thoughts. We do change our wording, but we basically just reinvent something else. And we say that thing is the same as this thing. So you can learn by analogy and you could fastly learn new things by taking what you already know and just expanding upon what that is, what it is from a general sense and what it is from a specific sense. Very similar to Einstein's theory of relativity. In fact, even before this 1800s, there's even an older quote from the Bible. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Now I promised we would get there, didn't I? Let's take a look at listing four. So in listing three, we read from a file. In listing four, we're going to read from what's called a socket. Now sockets, as we're going to see, because nothing is new in the world of computer science, is simply just like reading and writing a file. There's a few special things we have to do. So we have the main process function, like we shown you earlier. That hasn't really changed. Same function there. I'm going to scroll down. But our main function has to do a few things to set up this sort of socket before we can use it. So these first couple of commands are just kind of housekeeping things we need to do to say we're going to initialize a socket, we're going to set up the socket, we're going to copy the information into the socket, and then we're going to do what's called binding. So when you do socket programming, you have to bind to a port and you have to bind to an IP address. So you can see here the port that I'm binding to I called 1986. 
and I, I picked a port that was deliberately high and we'll learn about more why that is later. I said that I want to bind to the local host address, which the local host is called 127.0.0.1. So that's the IP address that's going to be doing the listening on that port 1986. And then I'm going to actually do the binding. And there's some helping things here. For example, if you try to bind the same port, so if this program ran twice and it was already listening on port 1986, the second time you try to do it, you're going to get an error because two systems can't bind listen on the same port at the same time. So again, we're just setting up our handlers, getting all of our ports ready. And then I'm going to say, okay, once I know everything's working, trying to accept connections. So this accept command is going to sit and wait for connections to come in. When a connection comes in, we do what's called forking. And I'll describe a little bit more about forking later. But for now, think of forking like cell division in biology. So you have a process that's going to be running in memory. It's going to split into two identical copies of that same program. So that listing four is going to become two copies of listing four. The primary one is going to have an ID of uh, not zero. So it's going to be sort of the parent. And then the one that has the PID of zero is going to be the child. Now the child is going to read and write information on the socket just like you would read and write a file. The commands are a little bit different. So the command to send information is called send or receive. Uh, when we want to write, we're going to say write. So we have receive and we have write. So we're going to keep reading, just like we're reading the file. We're going to read the first set of commands. We're going to process that command. And then once we processed it, we're going to write out what the result of that command was back to the uh, program that, that called the command. So let's compile that. So we're going to do something interesting. I'm going to open up two different screens here to try to show you how it all works. So in this screen, I'm going to be running what we call the server. So it's created the connection, it's sitting and it's waiting for connections to come in. Then I'm going to open up another copy and we're going to connect and we're going to call this the client. Okay. Now to make a connection, we're going to use the program called Telnet. So Telnet is a nice little program that allows you to connect to any listening server. Now in this case, my server is the same as my client, but we're going to connect to 127.0.0.1. I'm going to connect to that same process over here that's running. And I said the port was 1986, so that's the port that I'm going to type. So when I hit enter, you'll see that on this side, it says it's successfully connected. And on this side, you see that it's received a message, and now it's trying to handle that message. So the message from my server is saying, what is your command? So very similar to our listing one, except I'm reading and writing across the network instead of reading and writing a file or reading and writing standard console in or console out. Now, these two connections could potentially be millions of miles away connected over the Internet. In this example, they're both connected to the same server, but the concept is is they could be listening and one machine is connecting from say the University of New Brunswick and the other machine is connecting to Harvard and they're talking back and forth. So since I have that main process command I can type a command just like before like oh, a silly command and I get back bad command silly. Or I could type the echo hello and I get back the word hello. In fact, I could even type the command add. So I could say add, say three and two. And what's going to happen is the server is going to do the adding, say over in Harvard, imagine, and it's going to come back and tell me that the answer was the result five. We call this a remote procedure call. 
If you watch on this side, each time I've done those connections, you can see that it accepted a connection, that it took over that, it took my reading in of what I typed, and then it ran that process command and sent back the bytes back to, if this were pretend University of New Brunswick, sent the information back to me. Okay, let's take a moment to review again. So what we've learned from listing four is socket programming is really not that different from reading and writing a file. And we still use our process function. We still have our interpreter pattern to do the work. The difference is there's an internet server waiting for connections on a specified port. In my example, I use 1986. It reads the commands that come in on that port, processes them, and then it puts the result back to the machine. So Harvard might be the server making the connection, executing the command, and then sending the result back along the network to the client, which might be at the University of New Brunswick. So when we create that process command, we set a set of commands. The set of commands that we put together is called a protocol, how the system communicates from one machine to another. So in the early days, this was pretty much all done by universities. Universities would create these programs that would listen on ports, and it could be the simple mail transfer protocol, or it could be the uh, post office protocol, or there was a protocol at one point called the gopher protocol, and each one worked on a different port and had a certain set of commands that it accepted and that it sent responses for. And each of these, in order for all the machines to intercommunicate, would come together in what was called an RFC, or a request for comments. So a person would create something like the SMTP protocol, they would send out the request for comments, which basically described all the details of the commands that that protocol used. So if you wanted to look these things up yourself, you could go to Google. There's my cake. And you can type RFC for SMTP. And you'll get, they all have a number, so RFC 821 was their RFC originally written. And the lower the numbers mean the longer that RFC has been around. So this one was created in 1982. And it describes that set of commands running in that interpreter for how you would send and receive mail. So they were all written in this sort of, I don't know what you would call it, old style text format. And it would give the sequence of commands. and sort of describes what it would look like and draw the pictures. And if you scroll down, you'll see in mail, you would first say who you're from, who you're sending to, and it sort of defines the commands that you can type when you connect. What the date is going to be, that there needs to be a carriage return after it. And then it shows an example, mail from, the sender, the receipt has to come back and say, if that works, 250, okay. The receipt two, so these are the sequence of commands that send an email. Now, once we've read the RFC and we understand how to send an email following the, the set of commands, the protocol that work to make the send the email, let's have some fun with that, again, using Telnet. So in this case, I'm going to telnet to the actual mail server that I have, the SMTP protocol. So that's smtp.bellalliant.net. And we know from the, the RFC that the protocol I should use is port 25. So I'm going to go to that machine on port 25. It's going to come back and say, okay, I'm ready. The protocol then says I have to say, hello, who I am. Great. Now in order to, to identify where the message is coming from, the command is mail from, and I'm going to say I am bradet at bellalliant.net. It says, yes, I accept you as a sender. I would like to please send a message to bradet at gmail.com. It says, okay, I'm ready. Now I'm about to send the information in the message. So I'm going to type command data. So that's ready for me to send the message. I then repeat in the data, by the way, I'm Brad Det at bellalliant.net. I'm sending this to Brad Det at gmail.com. Subject of my message, this is a test. 
for internet programming 101. Then the body I'm going to send hello. I hope this email finds you well and good. The protocol says I need to end with a period and a thing. It tells me the message has been queued to be sent. If all works well, when I actually check my email, I say, oh, there's the email, this is a test, and there's the message. Hello, I hope, I hope this email finds you well and good. So once you know a protocol and you understand the set of commands, you can connect to it just like any other system would and send an email on its behalf. So that's what's happening in the background when you're sending an email. And all of the internet protocols work the exact same way. So let's review. Socket programming, not that difference from reading and writing to a file. The internet server waits for connections on a specified port. It reads a set of commands done by that interpreter pattern. It processes those commands and it outputs the result. Those set of commands are referred to as a protocol and all those protocols are defined within different documents called request for comments, which were the documents that were created at the time that the person at some university generally created how that protocol should work. And then everybody else wrote their servers and their clients to follow that protocol. So SMTP is an example of a protocol for sending messages. Receiving messages is done with a protocol called POP, the post office protocol. And the common web that we all see today uses a protocol called the hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP. Each of those protocols operate over what's called a well-defined port numbering range. So if you wanted to see that, you can actually go to Google and you can say internet defined port numbers. And you should be able to get the port number for all the different common internet ports. So if you were to scroll down, you would go to well-known ports. And you'll see that file transfer is done over port 21, secure shell is port 22, telnet is port 23, SMTP is port 25, that POP protocol is port 110, the internet HTTP uh, protocol that we use for the web, that's port 80, etc. Now a couple of really important things to understand in these examples. We use Telnet. Telnet is a simple client application that if you were to look at the code, basically opens a connection to that port, similar to what we've seen before, sends whatever command the user types over that port, that port then receives it and processes it, and then whatever gets back, Telnet displays at the screen. So it's a very simple thing that we can use for testing how our applications work. A couple of interesting things you'll notice. There was no inherent need for me to identify myself or authenticate myself in any way as built in to any of these uh, connections. What that means is that authentication is built on top of, in part of that protocol, but it's not foundational to the internet. The internet connections of opening sockets and listening to sockets and reading and writing is completely anonymous. Yes, there's an IP address that passed back and forth, but there's no notion of a user or who a user is. So in order for that to work, that authentication is actually built on top of that. It's not inherent. Also, in these examples, you'll see that all the data was sent back and forth along the network completely in plain text. There's no encryption. So somebody who's watching the traffic go back and forth over the network and sort of sitting in the middle can completely see all of the data that passes back and forth. Okay, so for our last couple of examples, let's put everything together that we learned and develop a very simple, very simple web server. So in order to know that, we need to understand the RFC for how HTTP works. So if I type RFC for HTTP, I'll get back the description of the RFC that explains the commands that the hypertext protocol must implement in order to work as a server. These all start generally the same way. The only one that I'm going to focus on today is the get command. There's actually many different commands. like head, post, put, delete, but we're just going to look at get. 
The get command retrieves whatever information in the form of an entity is identified by the request URI. So that's what we're going to implement. Let's look at our code. So the first thing, we have that usual setting up of the IP information. I have a very simple function here called read file. So all read file does is when given a file name, it's going to read the contents of that file. It's going to store the contents of that file in a string, and it's going to output that string back in the function. So read file just takes a file name, reads the contents, spits it back out in the return. Now our interpreter, I've changed the name from process to web process because it's going to be processing web commands. But you see it looks very much the same. It takes in a command, it takes in a result, it parses that result. But now my commands are different. Instead of having echo and add, I'm going to implement a command called get because the RFC 2616 says it needs to implement a command called get. And when it does that, it's going to look at that first parameter of get and it's going to assume that that's a file. And it's going to read that file, and it's going to read those contents, and it's going to store them into a string. Then it's going to output this message, because the protocol requires responding with HTTP, in this case 11200 OK, meaning I found that file, and I'm going to send it to you. So the file that I read, I'm going to output that OK message, I'm going to output that file contents back to the user. Now I could have a loop where I, I said implemented post, or if I implemented delete, or if I implemented put, but in this case, I'm not implementing those, so I just say not implemented, and I still have my bad command. Now, normally we know from reading the protocol that the protocol listens on port 80. The problem is a lot of servers don't allow you to listen on port 80 unless you're a highly privileged root user because it's reserved for uh, as a well-established port. So in my example, I'm going to listen on a different port, a port that I know is okay, and I call the port 8888. You'll also notice that before when I was doing my binding, I was binding to the local host, 127.0.0.1. When you bind to the local host, that means that only machines on the local host are allowed to connect. So it's a very secure way of doing things. You can play around with internet programming using local host, and you know that other people on the internet aren't able to connect to your server because it's only bound to that local network adapter. It's not really bound to your main network adapter that does your internet. In this case, I'm going to bind to 0.0.0.0. So what that actually means is listen on all of the ports on all of your network cards. So what that means is now, if that port is available, people can connect from the internet to read my web server. So if you think about maybe web servers that you've done in the past and you have to set up what's called a binding, what you're really doing is you're establishing the IP address of this piece of code and the port that it's going to listen on for connections. So we have the same similar thing where we can't bind, we're going to output an error message. Once we know that we're able to start accepting connections, we're going to start accepting it. This code is exactly the same as what you've seen before. We're going to fork the connection. If we're in the child, we're going to receive the message just like before. Now, of course, we're going to call the web process function, not just the process function, but it's going to look for that command called get. It's going to accept a file name, and then it's going to output the contents of that file name. So let's compile that and show you how that works. Okay, so let's compile listing5.c. Let's run our little server. So now it's waiting and it's listening for connections. Again, we'll use Telnet as an example. And I just want to show you that we actually have a file there called hello.html. And if I look at that, it's just a very simple HTML that just shows hello world. So if I try to connect to that, so I'm going to telnet.0.0.1 .0 just like before over port 8888 as a test. We see that it's successfully connected. Now my command, because the protocol says it needs to be called get, get, and I'm going to ask for that file, hello.html. So it should the, send that message over to the server. The server then says, yes, I have a file, hello.html. It's going to read that contents from that read file, and it's going to spit it back to me, and it outputs the file. So what this means is, because I have it all set it up and it's listening on any internet port, I actually have a little web server now running. I could go to here. I could type in my system. Now, I can't use localhost, 
but I know that that system is called 192.168.0.15. I know the port I created is called 8888, and I know the file is called hello.html. So when I hit enter, it goes out, it gets it, and it shows hello world. So we've successfully created our own little web server. Now, that's all well and good if all we want to serve is static HTML files. And in fact, in the beginning days of the internet, when the first web servers were created, that's essentially all they did. People would create all these collections of HTML files with hyperlinks of data, and they would put it on their web servers, and you would see that everything would link to everything else, and you would click around on it. But it's not really useful if you want to get dynamic information, if you want to read information from a database. So if a university already had a server that was, say, listed catalogs of information in the Library of Congress, how would you use the internet, how would you use the, the HTTP protocol, the World Wide Web, to access that database of information? We wouldn't create a separate HTML for every book that we had uh, and links to all those books, we'd want a nice way to search that and return dynamic results. So the first established way for doing that was called CGI bin. And CGI stood for the Common Gateway Interface. So that's what we're going to look at next. How do you have dynamic content also travel backwards and forwards? And again, you won't be surprised to realize that we're basically going to use the interpreter pattern to get us through that. Nothing new, same old thing, just in a different way. Common gateway interface. So let's look at how we do that. In listing six, we still have our process file, so it's very much like listing five. But we did something a little bit different in our read file command. Our read file command can now do two things. And we changed the name of it to process file because it's not always going to read the file. Sometimes it's going to execute the file instead. So we have a process file and it's going to take in a file name and it's going to check that file and it's going to say, is that file something that I can execute? Is it another program that's been compiled? that I can run. It's going to take uh, the parameters and now you'll see the way that I parse those parameters is a little bit different because the HTTP protocol tells us that we need to separate our parameters by a question mark and then a series of parameters separated by a parameter name and a value. And that's the way the URL needs to be constructed because that's how the RFC defines it. So we're going to break up those parameters that are going to get passed to that program. So that's what that line is doing. If we know that it's an executable file, we're going to actually execute the file and we're going to pass those parameters as command line parameters to that file. And we're going to read the result of that execution. If, on the other hand, it was just a regular file, not an executable file, then we're going to do it just the same way as always. We're going to read the file and we're going to spit it back out. Everything else in listing six is exactly the same. Our web process is still going to take our get command. But now instead of calling read file, it's going to call process file to determine whether or not it's executable. So we need an executable program. We need something that's going to dynamically do the work for us. So I created one called hello.c. So it's a very simple C program, very much like our hello world that we showed you in listing one. It outputs to the STD out. Now it's outputting out the HTML markup, HTML body, but then it has hello. And then the first parameter that was passed to that program gets executed. So what does that mean? So if I compile that, And this time, let's make it as hello. OK, so now I have a program called hello that when I run it and there's no parameters, it doesn't do anything. If I put Brad, it sticks out the HTML saying, hello, Brad. Or if I stuck out Dave, it'll say, hello, Dave. So it's dynamic, right? When I run it, it's going to output that particular HTML. Let's compile our web server. 
which now has the ability to execute programs, you can see there's my hello executable program. And let's start my web server. Now, if I do my hello.html, just like before, I still get back hello world, but I could just type hello and the RFC says that I have to put in a parameter name equals, let's say, mark. So it's going to run that program and it's going to pronounce pass mark as the first parameter. And we know that program returns hello mark. So this is the basics of how the common gateway interface works. It executes the program, passes in those parameters to the program, that then returns a set of results, which then come back up the port. I put Brad and get hello Brad or whatever I want. So now it's a dynamic program that takes the input from my system and sends it through. So think about some web programming that maybe you've done. Maybe it's in .NET or it's in Java or whatever language, and you don't see exactly what's happening, but what's really happening is you're building uh, a dynamic link library or you're building an executable file. You're building something that its job when it runs is to take a series of parameters on the command line, to take those parameters and then to output some sort of dynamic HTML result. So you might be in Dynet and you might have this page load event or you might have the uh, response.write commands that are writing the output back to the browser and you're calling databases and you're building your data and you're building your fancy HTML output, you're just basically building that container that's going to serve that file back with the HTML format with your dynamic content. So that's how your .NET works on top of your web server to send the information or your Java works on top of your Apache server. Or if you like to program in PHP, same thing, your PHP gets called by your web server to run that and then output the HTML. That's how it works. Okay, let's review again. Recall that now on top of the operating system, we have a command line interpreter. That command line interpreter has our web server on it now, which is listing on port 8888, and that was listing 6.c. On top of that, we have a web process function inside it that looks for that command called get and processes that sentence, executing that file. Now recall that that file, hello, takes the parameter brad, which is running the program hello.c, which takes in brad, which then outputs the HTML, hello brad, back to us. Now what's neat about this is I can have multiple programs that are executing outside of my web server that my web server calls. What does that mean exactly? Well, suppose that I created a program called add. Now remember that I had a function inside my web process before called add, but this is just a simple little bash script that takes two numbers and puts those numbers together. So I haven't changed my web server at all. You can see that it's running here over on this left hand side. This is my program called add. I can test it just by going add one and two, and I see that I come back with the result is three. Or add four and nine comes back with the result is 13. Again, with the HTML code wrapped around it. So without changing my web server, simply creating a new CGI bin program, in this case called add, I can go to my web browser. call my function add, pass in my parameters. So let's pass in the parameters, oh, I don't know, seven. And my second parameter will pass in, let's say 23. And it comes back and says the result is 30. Completely dynamic. That calculation is being done over on that other server. I'm seeing it here and it's changing the results. I can change around my numbers get back my new results. So the entire internet works exactly that way. We happen to be using the web protocol, could have used the simple mail transfer protocol, as you've seen when I sent an email. It's all using the same common idea of sockets, reading and writing sockets, and having some sort of command line interpreter. 
So that's basically how all internet programming works.